I'm Francine Lacqua and welcome to Bloomberg's Front Row. Today, we're talking to Daniel Pinto. He's a top executive at JP Morgan and a chief lieutenant to Wall Street titan Jamie Dimon. Softer spoken than his boss, he helps run the bank from his office in London. A native of Argentina, he started as a currency trader in Buenos Aires and worked his way up through emerging market desks, navigating financial blowups from Brazil to Russia. He's used to crises, but perhaps not what 2020 had in store. Touted as a potential successor for the top job, last March, he found himself at the reins at the height of the coronavirus pandemic. We learned a lot about how to manage the company in stress times and how people behave. So you see people under stress scenarios behaving in one way to the other. So you see what do you need to work with those people that may be leaders of these companies in the future to really prepare them for this type of environment. Daniel weighed in on everything from where he sees the biggest market risks. The crypto craze, SPAC regulation, and the emotions around football and the European Super League. Here's my conversation with Daniel Pinto. Now, you've had quite a big 2020. Uh, you were in charge of JP Morgan for a couple of months while Jamie Dimon was sick. What was it like? It was a tough time. Gordon and I ran the company for a couple of months while Jamie was in hospital. And it was not any other two months. It was at the time where we were making, when we were making the decisions to move the company to work from home, uh, all kind of stress situations. And it, we did well. Uh, and then Jamie came back as strong as ever. Uh, but we learned a lot. And we learned a lot about how to manage the company in stress times and how people behave. So you see people under stress scenarios behaving in one way to the other. So you see what do you need to work with those people that may be leaders of these companies in the future to really prepare them for this type of environment. So, so it, was, it was a fascinating time, very stressful, and we are very glad that Jamie's back and healthy to stay working with us, hopefully for many years. You're always named as one of the possible successors to Jamie Dimon. So what did you learn in terms of the leadership qualities needed to, to lead J.P. Morgan? Uh, I, th I think that J.P. Morgan, well, the lead, to lead the company in a stress time, you need to really be supportive, but you'll be able to uh, make strong decisions. In some cases, different to what other companies of other people are doing. So you really need to have a view uh, and execute relentlessly and, and really move the company forward and help the people along the way. Because there are some people that really rise in this sort of environment. There are people that panic and says, how do you bring all this group together to deliver for our clients mm -hmm. and maintain the company in the good standing as it is, 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 is very important. Hopefully, Jamie is here for a long time, so I don't have to do this again. <laughs> um, JP Morgan has really been going from strength to strength. I mean, your yes. last quarter was stellar. Yes. It, how can you stay on this trend? How difficult will it be? The first quarter was very strong. Last year was very strong as well, mainly driven almost all across the business, but mainly driven by the investment bank, both sales and trading and investment banking. But we have very good performance in the commercial bank, very good performance in asset and wealth management, uh, and, and a strong performance in retail, almost in every sector, mortgages, auto lending, um, uh, in, in the deposits. Mm -hmm. So the only portion that it was a bit slower is the revolving credit in credit cards that people have quite a bit of money saved so they are revolving less. They are, they are borrowing less. So, uh, but overall it was a very, very solid quarter even if you take away the release of reserves that, uh, that, that we have. And, and the second quarter seems to, is it on the same path? I think that when, when we I think about the first quarter, you have particularly in banking and uh, in sales and trading. So you have uh, the January and February very, very strong and March towards a bit more normalized level. So what I see for the rest of the year is probably going back to the more normalized levels of okay. 19 with some degree of growth.
for the for the quarters for the quarters to come. And so, is there any part when you look at the markets? How does that develop in the next couple of of months? I think that client activity is still quite high, not not at the levels that we saw late last year or during last year and in uh, in January and February, but it's still quite uh, quite quite active. So all the the, the with an economy that is growing so well. Mm -hmm. So you're going to have vibrant markets and good client engagement. But overall client activity, you think will pick up? I mean, what are clients feeling right now? Are they, are they ready to, get to, to do more once there's critical vaccination? Or is it a little bit in a wait and see? Well, client activity is quite healthy. Uh, what we are expecting in investment banking, for example, uh, an increase in M&A okay. from last year of around 20% in equity capital markets and similar amount between 10 to 20 percent. It was very, very strong in the first quarter, but I think that it will normalize mm -hmm. towards the end of the year. In high yield, a similar amount. In high grade, uh, less, because a lot of the issuance happened last year. So we have 1.7 trillion. Mm -hmm. This year, probably we're expecting 1.2 trillion in, uh, in high grade issuance. So, so we see a very healthy wallet growth in investment banking uh, this year. And in trading, as I said, probably a more normalized volumes in line with 19 with some degree of growth. Is there anything that feels frothy in the markets that you worry about either? I don't know whether it's bubble territory or something being mispriced. We have, it, it is a very interesting situation. Normally in any cycles, you would not have these type of valuations at the very uh, beginning of the cycle. So. That is something that you need to keep an eye on. Neither in other scenarios we have rates at zero, so low level of uh, interest rates. So when you think about valuations, and if you take the S&P, for example, and you compare the 22 times that is trading now to historical 20-year historical average, which is around 16, so it looks quite expensive. Oh. But rates are at zero. So if you were to think about valuations in terms of risk premium over the base rate, so it's over 500 basis points, which is very, very reasonable. And what you also have is an, a, a companies with that really delivering very, very good earnings. And I think that if rates, while rates still stay low, and earnings momentum is positive, it's very difficult to see the S&P uh, going down or, or other equity mm -hmm. markets ar around the world. So, so we, are, we think that the S&P will continue to perform mm -hmm. and equity markets will continue to perform. We need to be a bit more careful about what sectors, clearly mm -hmm. value stocks, that they, are, they will, will have a positive momentum with higher rates will do very well, but the overall markets, I find it quite healthy. And there's nothing systemic that you would worry about. I mean, we talk about shadow banking. We talk about possible zombie companies coming out when monetary policy normalizes. I think that you have to pick risk that could derail this sort of momentum in the market. It's either inflation or a bad turn of COVID. Uh, the other issues are very unlikely. They, they, it may be problems. It may be in this cycle, as right. it was in the previous cycle, some mini corrections along the way. Um, but a big derailment of the path of growth that will damage markets and will create a big correction, I just don't see it. We've all been following, you know, the GameStop, Reddit, mm -hmm. um, the, the, uh, that situation, and Archegos. If, if we talk about Archegos, why was JP Morgan not exposed to it? I'm not going to talk about a particular client. Clearly, Archegos wasn't uh, a client of us. No. Uh, but I, I can tell you, in a prime business, essentially when you onboard a client, what you have tried to understand is what is the portfolio that they want to prime with us? What is the correlation of that portfolio? What is the risk of that portfolio? What is expected leverage uh, of that portfolio? And that will define what is our risk appetite. So if that client wants a risk parameter that is beyond what our risk appetite is, we will just not onboard that client. 
is there a danger that there are more archegoses out there that could actually be more systemic for the financial system as, as a whole? Difficult to know. I don't know. It's impossible to know how many positions are in, across all prime. Uh, I, I really doubt that at this time in the cycle, this, there will be a lot of situations similar to, uh, to this. And if they are, I think that all those banks, they will be already dealing with it, meaning just reassessing the amount of leverage and having transparency across the portfolio of the client, the client not just the portion that you prime. So, so I'm sure this is being a wake-up call for many primes, including us. We went and review everything to make sure that we don't have situations that we would feel uncomfortable with. So on the GameStop issue, and yes. I know you don't want to talk about you know, specific companies, but actually if you extrapolate, what does, it, what does it mean for a lot of retail investors coming into the market like that? Well, I think that people have to be careful uh, in the sense that social media could be a very good positive force, and in some cases it could be a negative force that induces people to do something that then may regret. So markets go up and go down. In the case of GameStop, a lot of people make a lot of money, a lot of people lost uh, a lot of money. On the consumer side, forget about the mm -hmm. hedge funds, that they may have been short and they lost money. Could it ever become at such critical mass that, that it starts moving something? I mean, at some point there's speculation about oil or, or other parts of the market. I, I think that uh, you will have to keep in consideration when you are managing your or your own risk no. as a company, these factors. So if there are big technical positions in a particular asset class, on a particular stock or a particular commodity, so then you want to keep in mind that something like again stop may happen again. So therefore you want to be careful about how much risk you take mm -hmm. and how you are planning to manage that risk. Talk to me about cryptocurrency or Bitcoin. First of all, what do you think it is right now? The, the issue with price of Bitcoin, high or low, is impossible to define because it's an asset class that is based on the confidence that you, will, you buy it, you will be able to sell it at a better price in the future and someone will buy it from you. Uh, there is no intrinsic value. There is no value on as a payment method mm -hmm. because as that is very slow, it's very difficult to go and buy a coffee and pay with Bitcoin. So it's essentially a place to store value. And that value is driven by confidence. So the risk to Bitcoin is relatively simple. It's the risk that something happens that destroys that confidence. For example, fraud, keys being stolen, things like that. But uh, the size, you know, at the moment, it hasn't really had an impact on other asset classes, right? Uh, can it at some point actually impact uh, move currencies, move other parts of the market j just because of its size? How much are clients asking about it? So how, how you know, I don't know whether th most of them want uh, some kind of exposure to Bitcoin in their portfolio. Uh, I, I mean, it. Uh, so there is, there is clearly, when you think about private bank, clearly the individual clients are asking about our participation or mm -hmm. not in, a, in this asset class. There are some funds mm -hmm. that they have announced that they are going to put, uh, invest a USB coin of one of the asset classes within some of their uh, funds. Uh, and we will, our strategy will be to accompany the clients. So if the institutional clients in the wholesale business require us to help them with custody, we will work with one of the rep reputable exchanges like Coinbase to be our custodian, sub custodian, and we will provide book and records of their in their in their portfolio. So uh, it may be that we have to have some limited trading activities or trading the futures. So depending what is the client demand, mm -hmm. it will require uh, some degree of services. From, from us. At the moment, in the wholesale space, it's not much. 2020 was also the year of the SPAC. It yes. seems like you know, anyone who was, I mean, anyone was creating a SPAC. Are we coming back to now more kind of normal valuation for SPACs? Has the furore died down a bit? 
So SPACs is another derivative of the same situation. A lot of money to be invested, looking for avenues to get that cash invested. So SPACs is not a new product, it's been there forever, but the, num the volumes that we are seeing now, now is totally unprecedented. So what do we have now? We have 155, 125 billion of IPO money, money that is being raised to the IPO process of the SPAC. If you add to that the pipes, assume two times, so you get to a money to be invested in total equity of roughly $400 billion in the system. When you think about the volumes of IPO excluding a SPAC, in the last three or four years, it ranges between 35 to 70, last year, $70 billion a year. So this is multiples of that. I think that what it may happen, that some of these packs, they will not find the target and they will have to be redeemed. The money is in, a, in an escrow and, and, and some of them will find the target. I, I think that from our point of view, the key, the, 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 the way to manage the risk is to find, to, to support a, a good sponsor yeah. that knows the sector, has a track record of managing companies or investing in companies to make sure that the SPACs will invest prudently in their target. So, But is there a danger now that some SPACs aren't just because they, they're, I mean, what you're talking about is basically money needing to find an outlet. Yes. What does, what does it look like in 12 months? Well, the, the, the risk here, and I hope this doesn't happen, is that you ended up, the SPACs are two years, you have two years to find the target. So you get towards the end of the two years and you're more desperate mm -hmm. to find the target and you ended up paying an amount that is not in line with the value of what you're buying. Uh, so that's risk number one. Risk number two is SPACs at the end, after the whole process, it ended up being a public stock that is going to be traded by public. So in my view, the, the standards that SPAC should be accountable for, it should be very similar to the, the standards that you follow when you do an IPO. So if that were to happen, so then I don't see there is too much of the problem here, that be beyond the point that probably some of the SPACs they will not, if they want to be prudent, they may not find their target. But, but IPOs are regulated, SPACs aren't. So should they be? No, no, SPACs are regulated. You have to but find not... with SEC. There are some small differences, and if you read uh, or analyze the comments from the SEC, they are more and more in line of requiring SPACs to have a similar standards and IPOs. Do you worry that any of this money looking for a home, I don't know, you can call it search for yield, or, you know, goes somewhere which actually blows up, that, 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 that there's going to be a some kind of market event, which we could call a black swan or whatever you want to call it, that actually turns ugly? Well, Francine, we, we talked in the past about, in the last few times, about market liquidity. Yeah. And when you think about what happened in March and April last year, so it was just a demonstration that there is a problem. And the problem is markets are not as liquid. The size, the, the amount at the time where clients need to reduce risk or okay. in, the, there is not enough capital to facilitate the intermediation process. And that creates massive massive volatility. Uh, obviously at that point, we knew that something was going to happen because a 10 year cycle will not last forever and it will be an event at some point. No one thought about COVID, mm -hmm. but that's what it was. But we saw the markets being extremely disrupted, mm -hmm. totally volatile, very little liquidity, some of the asset classes totally dried up. What well, this, this time, it was done very well by the Fed, by other mm -hmm. central banks, is that they intervene and they get the markets, the confidence for those markets to function. So therefore, 
we have extreme volatility and yeah. then the market come down and it started operating uh, regularly and, and normally. I think that the next time around, if you have or not have central bank intervention, you have different levels of volatility. What triggers it is really difficult to know. I was going to ask you what kind of timeline, but... I, I think that we are, at, at the moment, I think that there is enough momentum in the economy that I really doubt that you're going to have uh, a, re, a, a cycle in the economy that is so short that it will put the economy into recession and trigger um, a market sell-off. So I, I don't think that is scenario is probably a few years away. Um, at the moment, it's difficult to know what could it be in the short term. Talk to me about ESG. Okay. So how much, I mean, again, 2020, the year where we had COVID, where we could rebuild better. Do you see investors really, you know, putting their money where their mouth is? So really asking for ESG, asking for accountability, even tr trying to understand, um, you know, how they can put pressure on companies to become more green. There is not a single meeting that you go with a client, investor, or a company, or a hedge fund, anyone, that this issue doesn't come up. And the difference from the past to now, that everyone is taking action. Uh, it is the way that you have, it's not just to show a couple of numbers, it's a way that you have to run the company on a day-to-day -day, day yeah. basis. This company and, and any other. So we are going to see more and more investors pressuring issuers mm -hmm. to ad adhere to certain, uh, to certain standards. As a company, we have done a lot. Uh, we have announced our alignment with the Paris Agreement in certain mm -hmm. sectors like auto, power, and oil and gas. We have announced the 2.5 trillion green and developing financing mm -hmm. uh, for the next 10 years. So, and, and most important than these numbers is really you have to incorporate it in the day that day to day, that the way that you, day by day you run your company, yeah. and in in the way that you make your decisions. So, uh, and I think that most of the companies are moving that way. So it's not just put a number out there, tick the box, and move on. I think that is 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 very much embedded in the way that we do business. Could, could you see you know capital dislocation because of it, or it's not something that? I don't think so. I think that it's a healthy okay. pressure from investors to issuers, from issuers to suppliers across the economy of doing better. And I think that that is fantastic. Uh, 2016 was br the Brexit vote year. Yes. Um, now we've finally Brexited. How has London changed? Uh, not much so far. <laughs> Still a great place to live. Um, I'll tell you about our company, and we said at the beginning that because we have a substantial operation in Europe, in the continent, we, were, we will have to move a few hundred people. And that's exactly what happened. But there is something else that happened too. When I look at the amount of people that we have in the UK, by the end of 2018, it was around 17,000. What we are expecting by the end of next year is to be around 19,000. In Europe, we have around 4,000, and we're expecting to have around 6,000 by the end of 22. Out of this increase of 2,000, so a few hundred are the ones that we move, the rest are people that we hire in the continent, mm -hmm. some because of business growth, Sounds because you are bifurcating the operation, so and require to repeat whatever you do in one place to do it in the other. So overall, JP Morgan, we have 4,000 more employees between the two places that we have in 2019. But what about the impact of, I mean, the fact that the UK doesn't have financial equivalency, yeah. it, it, it has an impact on how London will operate. I think that London was is and will be a very important financial center. I have no doubt about it. And I think that Europe have a chance to become another important financial center. 
What it is also important is in the process to get there, we don't have unintended consequences that could damage our clients. For example, activities that may reduce market liquidity and increase volatility, excess excessive cost extra for the banks that they operate in two places. So they have to minimize it. Our, this industry is not an industry of very high returns as an average. So therefore, to be able to minimize the cost of this inefficiency that, tends, that, that is driven by splitting the operations in two, it, it needs to be minimized. So, and, and I think that if regulators try to achieve their goals in both sides, mm -hmm having their client needs in mind, it will be a good outcome for both sides. What did you learn from the delivery IPO? I don't want to talk about a particular uh, client, but I, I think that it was the first time that there is a premium listing with dual voting, uh, and there were some clients that uh, they were uncomfortable with that, very few. It was the the, the book was massively oversubscribed in the run up to the IPO. There were quite a lot of shorts in the markets that were put around the time of the IPO, and there were a few asset managers that didn't didn't want to uh, didn't want to participate. I think that there is uh, some work being done by the regulators about the concept of dual dual voting uh, and. Uh, pre uh, premier listing. So uh, in the U.S. it works exist, it's very normal, mm -hmm. but you don't include that stock in the main indexes. So therefore the asset managers that for whatever reason don't want to participate, yeah. so they don't have yeah. to buy it because if not you have a track error uh, with, the, with the index. So, so it, it doesn't dent the um, desirability of London as an IPO destination? No, I think that this is just one experience. Uh, the focus from the regulators is in the right one. Let's see what it worked and what didn't work, what needs to be changed, and, uh, and move on. I know there's a lot of excitement about your uh, UK retail bank. Yes. Um, you're hiring 400 people for it, if I'm not mistaken. Do yeah. you have a name for it? Not yet, uh, <laughs> but it will be under the brand of Chase. Uh, so I think that is a great opportunity and I think that is we chose in the UK because it's a very developed market we have a big operation here mm -hmm. and it's a great place to test if a digital bank from us it will have a good uh, client take and customer take so we will see the idea is not just to do it in the UK if this work is to to expand in other places around the world. But Europe or, or yes. elsewhere? So first Europe, like the, the UK is basically a test case for, for what parts? So clearly we have a very strong, amazing retail business in the US. I think that the ability to expand and diversify that business outside the US is good. Um, we will see in time if it is possible or, or not. Uh, we will try with the UK. We'll start with the UK. We will okay. probably expand into Europe, into Latin America uh, over time. Um, Daniel, how do you expect COVID-19 and the pandemic to impact working from home? So does it, do, do you have to be more flexible with working from home offerings to attract top talent to, to your bank? I, I think that, yes. The, the scenario that I see is going back 100% to work from the office every day of the week is a very low probability. Going, having everyone working from home all the time, it is a bad idea because I think that over time you will lose a lot of creativity, innovation that comes out of the personal interaction on a day-to-day -day basis and you will destroy the culture of the company. So the model that I like and we like is the model of rotation. What are you doing for your junior bankers? Some of your rivals came under fire for, for working them too hard and, and them not having enough time off. Um, junior and senior bankers over these days are working a lot because the volume of transactions has really increased a lot. 
So we are hiring more juniors and, and, and analysts and associates mm -hmm. to really support the increase in activity. And juniors want to work hard. They want to be recognized for the hard work they do. They don't want to do things that they are not impactful. They don't want a senior banker to ask them to do 10 turns of a pitch book before they, they, the senior banker, opens the first page the first time. So they want to be treated respectfully. They want to be recognized. They want to be part of the solution to a client, to a client need. And I think that we, need, we have done a lot of that. JP Morgan has been in the news <clears throat> nonstop. Uh, linked to um, to this uh, European Super League. Yes. Is is there a reputational damage? I mean, emotions are pretty high regarding this. It's football. It's very emotional. Um, I, I don't think that there is a reputational damage here. Uh, what I would say is the following: We arrange a loan for a client. It's not our place to decide. How, what is the optimal way for football to operate in Europe and in the UK? So we hope that the Super League, UEFA, FIFA, the national uh, leagues get together and decide what is the way, this Super League way or any other way. And then from there, hopefully, it will be a good, it would be better for the game altogether. If through that process this deal happens or there is any other way that we can support football in the region, we will do it. But do you feel like you've been dragged into something that you no. weren't expecting to We, blow we were up expecting so much? this to be emotional. We were expecting to have people to have different opinions, and that is what is happening.